conference over to Dwayne Brown. Thank you, sir. Please begin. Thank you, operator, and uh, uh, happy Friday to everyone. I want to thank folks for joining us. Uh, this is a great day for NASA and for humankind with the first spacecraft to successfully into orbit around a dwarf planet. Today, you're going to hear uh, how that happened, why it's important, and uh, why it is so historic in nature. Uh, we're going to have, actually, we're going to have three folks on the uh, call here. Uh, first up, you're here, uh, Mark Raymond, the Chief Engineer and Mission Director for Dawn. We'll give you the specifics on how this historic achievement happened today. Uh, he will be with us for about 15 minutes, and then he's got to go off to take care of some other business. But if there's any uh, other questions directly associated with the engineering and the process of getting in orbit, we can certainly do follow-up interviews with him. Uh, following Mark will be Carol Raymond, the Dawn Mission Deputy Principal Investigator at the Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, and uh, Mark is also at uh, JPL. And following Carol will be Jim Green, the director of the Planetary Science Division here at NASA headquarters with his portfolio, everything going on. This is just the beginning of several months of incredible science discovery and exploration. Uh, this call will be replayed uh, in its entirety until Wednesday. That call-in number to hear this entire teleconference is 888-562-0226. And again, I uh, want to thank you. If you have any other questions, my name is Dwayne Brown with the Office of Communication. So let's get started, and let's start out with Mark. Well, thank you. So we're here to talk, as you heard, about the, the first exploration of the first dwarf planet. So Ceres was discovered in 1801, and it's beckoned for more than two centuries. And finally today, Dawn answered that cosmic invitation. So it's using its advanced ion propulsion system, which I actually first heard of in a Star Trek episode from the logical Mr. Spock. And using it, it's flying a, a complex and elegant course into orbit that I think would be the envy of any Cracker Jack spaceship pilot. So at about 4.39 a.m. Pacific time today, Ceres reached out and tenderly took Dawn into its permanent gravitational embrace. So the spacecraft is in orbit and it will spend the rest of its operational life there and will be there long, long beyond. Now, because it's using an ion propulsion system, the way it enters orbit is very different from what you normally think of. You tend to think of there being a spacecraft coming screaming up at high velocity, executing a whiplash-inducing, bone-rattling burn to drop into orbit. But Dawn does it differently. The ion propulsion system is fantastically efficient, 10 times the efficiency of conventional chemical propulsion, but it's also very gentle. And in fact, if you hold a single piece of paper in your hand, the paper will push on your hand as hard as the ion engine pushes on the spacecraft. And so the spacecraft just gradually, elegantly, gracefully crept up on series and slipped into orbit. And so you also tend to think of there being a room full of tense, anxious people biting their nails, waiting to know whether there's going to be success or failure, but that's not the way it worked today. Mission control was empty. We weren't anxious or concerned. If there had been a glitch, which there was not, we could have gotten into orbit some other day because the ion propulsion system gives us fantastic maneuverability. So in my mind, the drama isn't in whether the mission will succeed or fail, you know, whether there'll be a single glitch that could cause a catastrophic loss or whether even a tiny mistake could spell doom. Rather, the drama is in the opportunity to unveil the wonderful secrets of the largest unexplored world in the inner solar system. And so today, when Dawn went into orbit at about 38,000 miles altitude, as it and Ceres were traveling together around the sun at nearly 39,000 miles per hour, that's what happened. So that's just a little bit of an overview, and now I'll turn it back to Dwayne. Thank you, sir, and uh, congratulations. And uh, Carol. Hi. Um, uh, we are really excited to be beginning this uh, historic exploration of dwarf planet series, which we also refer to as a protoplanet. 
Um, we think of Ceres and Vesta as uh, building blocks of the terrestrial planets, and uh, they represent about 40% of the mass of the entire main asteroid belt. So together they are uh, very different objects than most of the other material there, which is largely collisional debris that's left over from the, the violent um, scattering of material by Jupiter's gravity field. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we'll be beginning our 16-month investigation of Ceres, in which we're going to spiral ever closer to the surface, executing a series of four science orbits. Our first science orbit will begin on April 23rd at about 8,400 miles from the surface. And between now and the start of that orbit in April, um, we will not be getting any more images because we are swinging around the dark side of Ceres um, at the moment. When we do get into that first science orbit, we'll get um, much better views of details of the surface. We'll watch Ceres rotate uh, again from several vantage points. And we'll be able to look at the, uh, the illuminated um, disk of Ceres to look for any material which might be lofted off of the surface by uh, gases escaping from Ceres itself. Um, so that will be an opportunity for us to uh, follow up on the detection of water vapor near Ceres, which was made by the European Space Agency's Hubble Herschel Space Observatory um, and was reported in um, 2014. After the RC3 orbit, we'll spiral down to our first mapping orbit at 2,700 kilometers, sorry, 2,700 miles altitude. And there we'll be getting a very detailed look at the minerals of the surface, as well as the geologic features. We carry, uh, in addition to cameras, which everybody is um, knowledgeable about from the fantastic images which have been returned, we also have uh, an infrared spectrometer and a visible uh, channel spectrometer, which are going to allow us to make um, very uh, detailed maps of the composition or the minerals on the surface. And those allow us to infer processes that are going on below the surface and via the impacting um, processes that um, leave evidence behind on the surface. After um, that complete global mapping with our spectrometer, we spiral down to uh, um, an orbit with which allows us to get very detailed shape information, uh, basically build a topographic map of the surface and start mapping the geologic features in um, exquisite detail. And then finally, we, we, we spiral down to just 230 miles above the surface of this um, body, which is 600 miles in diameter, and we map its elemental composition, its gravity field, and look at surface features as small as 40 meters across. So by the time we finish um, in mid-2016, we're going to know Ceres in uh, exquisite detail. We're going to understand why it has bright, very, very bright spots which are uh, unique to any body in the solar system that's been explored thus far. Um, and we're going to understand what Ceres means um, in terms of a building block for uh, planets in our solar system. And back to you, Duane. Thank you. And now to uh, Dr. Jim Green, Director for Planetary Science Division here at NASA Headquarters. Jim? Thank you, Duane. You know, uh, DAWN is uh, not an acronym. You know, NASA loves acronyms, and, uh, but DAWN really refers to a mission that's going back in time. It's visiting a region in the asteroid belt. It's been at Vesta, as was discussed, and now at Ceres, the number one and number two sized bodies in, in the asteroid belt. And, and that whole area has been the same for billions of years. It's a region where a planet should have been, but no planet was created. It's a region where Jupiter's gravitational interaction with this region has kept these pieces apart. Ceres, that protoplanet, that beginning seed of a planet, 
now allows us to look back in time to see how terrestrial planets are, are put together. It's spherical, which we now know means that uh, that it, it is gravity and it's heat inside due to radioactive materials that it has created is a loud material that is heavy to sink to the bottom, probably has a core that's fairly extensive, silicate rock crust, and now we know extensively about its ice shell, but we need to know much more about it. Its ice shell surrounds the, the body, and it is a uh, beautiful, beautiful example now of our dwarf planets, those things that are building blocks of planets. So uh, Dawn is just um, such, an, such a wonderful mission to explore that early part of the solar system because it's right here in front of us today. What we learn about Dawn, from Dawn, about our building blocks, about this region, about these asteroids, I'm sure will also inform us about other solar systems and how rocky planets are created in those locations around other stars. So it's a tremendously historic mm -hmm. uh, mission, and we're delighted it's there safely, and we can't wait for the science results to come out. So with that, let me turn it back over to Dwayne. Thank you all. Before we uh, go into the Q&A, just a, a, a couple of uh, uh, follow-ups here. Uh, for Mark Raymond, who was his name was not listed on the advisory, let me make sure uh, you all have his spelling right. It's uh, M-A-R-C-R-A-Y-M-A-N. That's M-A-R-C-R-A-Y-M-A-N. And again, Chief Engineer and Mission Director for Dawn at the Jet Propulsion Lab. And I may have... Uh, Miss, uh, giving out the wrong information on when the pictures uh, will actually be taken. Uh, Mark, did you want to uh, clarify uh, when the pictures will come in? Or start? Yes, as um, Carol or somebody said, we're on the dark side of series now, so we're using a combination of series gravity and the ion engine to sort of pull Dawn back towards series. And so we're not taking pictures now, but we will resume taking pictures April 10th and so we'll take pictures a few more times before we get down to this first 8,400 mile altitude intensive, uh, or this orbit at, at 8,400 miles from which we take intensive observations. Thank, thanks for clarifying that, Mark. Uh, my sure. mistake on that. So um, I know Mark is going to have to leave us. He has other commitments, but again, if you have any specific engineering questions, we can get to those at a later time today uh, if uh, we don't have the answers. So with that, let's go ahead, operator, and transition into the uh, Q&A. Thank you. At this time, if you wish to ask a question, please unmute your phone and press star 1. Again, that is star 1 if you wish to ask a question. One moment, please, for questions to queue. Again, that is star one for questions. One moment. We have one question on the line. One moment. Our question will come from Ken Kramer. Your line is now open. Oh, hi. Thank you, and uh, congratulations to the Dawn team and NASA for a fantastic result today. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, what will the spacecraft be doing in the next um, in the next few weeks uh, before you take images. When talk a little bit more about when you'll also be activating the science instruments. And um, um, I, I think you released one picture today. Are, are there any others we can expect from uh, March 1st? Thanks. I can take part of that with regard to what the spacecraft is going to be doing. It's continuing to use its ion propulsion system to reshape its orbit now around Ceres, aiming for this circular polar orbit at 8,400 miles. And in the meantime, it's now going up to a higher altitude. So at, when it was captured, it was around 38,000 miles in altitude. But on March 19th, it will be at the apex of its orbit, the apogee, a term I know you know, Ken, of yep. nearly 47,000 miles. So it's continuing to thrust. 
It's reshaping the orbit, changing the plane of the orbit because we want to fly over the poles by flying over the North Pole, then south toward the equator, and then over the South Pole as Ceres rotates underneath the spacecraft, it gives us a view of the entire surface. And so there's a lot more maneuvering ahead so that we can begin taking the detailed science observations. We're also, we have the, we've used both the camera and the combination visible and infrared mapping spectrometer, but we have not yet turned on the gamma ray spectrometer nor the neutron spectrometer. That is, we haven't turned them on here at Ceres, Obviously, we've used them extensively before, and so that's going to happen soon as well. So as, as far as the um, better image data, um, we, we do have two opnows before we get into the RC3 orbit. But as I said before, the RC3 orbit is when um, we will be seeing um, a, a, a big um, change in our understanding of the surface of Ceres. Were there any other images from March 1st? That's what I was wondering. Oh, um, no. Um, the the images that were released, um, not uh, every image was released, but they're, they're similar to the one that was released. So there's not going to be a rotation movie or anything like that? Okay, thank you. No, no, it was a, it was a more limited um, image acquisition for um, optical navigation purposes. All right, thank you. And as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star one now. Our next question will come from Mike Wall. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi guys. Thanks again for actually doing this. And yeah, yeah, so congratulations on this big milestone. I just had a question. You guys went into a little detail about what the science is going to attempt to answer. Um, but yeah, I mean, are there any things in particular that like you're looking forward to, Carol? Mm -hmm. Or to Mark, um, are there any particular questions you're you're sort of most excited to like try to learn the answers to? Would it be the bright spots, the plumes, anything in particular? Um, yeah, I'll I'll take a shot at that. Um, so the bright spots and the plumes are really kind of um, symbols of what we're after at Ceres, and it, it's really to understand how a body um, accreted from the solar nebula, how it came together from the, um, the primordial you know, proplanetary disk, um, and then what processes acted on that material to the, um, the body that we see today. And the body we see today, uh, as, um, as Jim was describing, we know it has a, an ice layer um, because its density is so low compared to rock that um, we know that it's, it still has um, rock and ice. But we don't know in what proportion. So we don't know how much of the water came out of the hydrated, um, rocky, chondritic material. And so we're after um, the interior structure. Did, did Ceres heat up enough that it has a, a very dry uh, interior with um, increasing hydration towards the um, surface? or um, or was there a process by which uh, most of the water was removed um, without causing um, uh, a lot of dehydration of the rock? Or so, so the, the comparison would be, um, do we have sort of the uh, leftover um, hydrated rock with a, um, just the, the lightest watery um, ice coming up to the top, or did we um, fully dehydrate um, part of that um, rock? And, and that's important because it speaks to what was going on at the water-rock interface in the past. Um, we think there was an ocean on Ceres. We're, um, ba based on the, the heat that would have been coming out of the interior, that uh, the current ice layer would have been um, liquid in the past. And so that um, warm ocean-rock interface is the type of uh, environment that we recognize would be um, conducive to life, so a, a habitable environment. We really want to get back to better understanding um, what Ceres was like in the past so that we can um, answer these questions about its potential habitability and um, how a body like Ceres formed and evolved over time. And ultimately, because there are other bodies like Ceres um, that 
likely rained in on the inner planets um, when uh, during some uh, cataclysmic scattering events, um, objects like Ceres likely brought water to the inner planets and to the Earth. And so by, by examining it closely, we get um, a, kind of a window into that um, uh, type of a body that, that may have been quite important to our own planet's evolution. Yeah, this is Jim Green. From my perspective, um, when you uh, look at Vesta, you see how cratered it is. And it's, it's uh, of course, uh, half the size of, of Ceres or so. And then when you look at Ceres, you see also heavily cratered uh, areas, but you also see some large areas that are quite smooth. That's got to mean that the interior uh, has communicated to the surface. And as Carol said, it's changed over time, and that's exciting. The next step, of course, when I look at it uh, as head of planetary science, I know we're going to be flying through the Pluto mm -hmm. system, and we're going to be looking also at other icy bodies. So uh, uh, that's going to be another opportunity for us to compare Ceres with Pluto. Now, Pluto is, is twice the size of Ceres. So there's a normal progression in sizes within our solar system that also allows us to do these inner comparisons. Their position and, and the mater raw materials where they are that, that they've accumulated can tell us a lot about the uh, evolution of our solar system. And so we've got a lot to learn, and, and Ceres is uh, that next step. Thank you. And as a reminder, please press star 1 now if you wish to ask a question. One moment, please. This time, I'm showing no further questions. I will hand the call back to Dwayne Brown for closing remarks. Well, thank, thank you, Operator. Sh short and sweet. Um, again, I want to thank folks uh, for listening in, and we can certainly uh, do any follow-up interviews you may have. I want to thank Mark for giving us an update on where we are now uh, with the images and with the spacecraft. Uh, any Im images or any other Information will be on the website at www.nasa.gov slash dawn. And this conference call will have a replay until Wednesday at 888-562-0226. Uh, thank you again. Congratulations to the team. And uh, have a great weekend. Back to you, operator. Thank you. With that, we'll conclude the conference. Thank you for your participation. We disconnect at this time.